And now for something completely different. Forget everything you've been told by others before. Get ready for the real deal. The full story. Real talk about money, markets, life. Now, it's The Real Investment Show with Lance Roberts. Presented by RIA Advisors. And good morning and welcome to, of course, the hump day edition of The Real Investment Show. It's Wednesday already. Yep, second day of the week and it's Wednesday. I know, it's like the time warp. Uh, so, already your first week of the, of the new year, almost over. So, just hang in there. We're almost there. Um, th- there was a very interesting TikTok yesterday talking about uh, millennials, right? And they've now started, you know, you've heard about this quiet quitting where, you know, I'm just not being paid enough to do my job, so I'm just going to not really do my job, right? They now have a thing called the bare minimum Monday, which is basically just doing the bare minimum on Mondays just to get your paycheck and go home. So, you know, there, there's, a, there's a problem with this is that ultimately uh, the people who run the business kind of catch on to what's going on. They go, well, if you're going to do the bare minimum, I'm going to do the bare minimum and not need you anymore. So <laughs> this is going to be the ultimate issue. <laughs> so yeah, well, you know, at some point somebody's got to work. That's, that's, you know, it's kind of the way it works. Uh, anyway, a uh, couple of things yesterday. Uh, markets did sell off here a little bit. We'll talk about this uh, in just a moment. Uh, futures are pointing lower again this morning. And, you know, obviously this isn't really surprising at all. I mean, we've talked about how big of a move the market has made, but we'll, we'll get into the technicals here in, in a second. Um, you know, but as we start to kick off the new year, you know, kind of all eyes are on the, you know, the first five days of the year. That typically sets up the, the month of January. The month of January sets up the year. So, so goes the old saying, the first five days, so goes the first five days of January, so goes the month, so goes the month, so goes the year. That's the theory. Now, seasonally speaking, right, we're in the, the fourth year of a presidential cycle. It's a presidential election year. That has a 76 probability, uh, 76% probability of being a positive return year with an average return of about 10%. So, as, as, and we kind of talked about this yesterday uh, on our blog post on our website at realinvestmentadvice.com. So if you haven't read that post yesterday on January resolutions, uh, I encourage you to do that. Uh, the important thing, though, is as we start looking out, we had a 24.2% re- uh, return in the market last year, uh, which also tends to bode well for the following year. And again, it's just kind of a function of momentum, right? You have a lot of momentum in the markets. You have a lot of positive kind of bias towards the markets now. You know, all, a lot of those bearish concerns are starting to fade away. Uh, we're starting to see more and more people that were in the very bearish camp starting to become more bullish. And, you know, that's not surprising. Economic growth continues to kind of tick along here. doesn't seem to be any real kind of situation uh, weighing on that uh, 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 um, investment into the country. And we start seeing, you know, money spent on productive investments, et cetera, that's continuing to increase. That's a function of all that capital that we put in through the Inflation Reduction Act, the CHIPS Act. So that's now showing up in the economic data, and that's helping support some of these outlooks for higher growth rates as we get into further into this year uh, for earnings as well for corporations. So again, this is why analysts are very optimistic about this coming year as we start going. But again, it's very early. We're only in the second day of the new year in terms of trading, so <laughs> there's a lot of stuff that can happen. So you know, while the outlook is certainly bullish for this year, just statistically speaking, Um, you know, it certainly also pays to pay attention to some of the risk. And, you know, some of the big questions that we're going to be wrestling with over the next couple of months is, you know, uh, will the Magnificent Seven, which were the big drivers of the market last year, will they repeat that performance this year? Or will this be a year where they underperform and the other 493 stocks do better? Uh, Yesterday was a good example of that. Tech had a big sell-off yesterday, but uh, healthcare, which was a big laggard last year, perform very well. So are we starting to see that rotation in the market? Now, it's too soon to tell. It's just been one day. But we'll, we're going to kind of see, you know, kind of where we go from here. Uh, here's what you need to know before the bell this morning, though. Uh, the markets did correct yesterday, and we did come down and actually touch the 20-day moving average yesterday. Uh, we did bounce off of that at the end of the day. Again, money coming into the market, not surprising, but the market did end in the red 
yesterday. This morning, futures are pointing lower again. We're down about 17 points pre-market on the S&P. NASDAQ's down about 88 right now. So again, another day where we're going to see kind of more pressure in those kind of high tech, uh, big mega cap names. Uh, going to kind of pressure the market this morning. Uh, but we did actually trigger that MACD sell signal yesterday from a fairly high level. And again, we talked about that negative divergence in relative strength yesterday. Uh, that's continuing to suggest that we may see some lower prices here near term as we kind of work through this uh, kind of this uh, correctional process that we've been in. Now, importantly, um, you know, and again, the, there's not uh, you know, a whole lot of concern here by any stretch of the imagination. Um, you know, we've had periods before where the market's been very elevated on kind of an overbought condition. And, you know, we had these corrections that, that occurred. Um, so again, kind of what you're looking for here is, you know, a break of this uptrend, which is what we're kind of working on right now. If we take out this 20 day moving average, that's going to suggest that we get a bit bigger correction uh, down to around 4,500 on the S&P wouldn't be surprising here. And that would just basically kind of encapsulate everything going back to where the Fed kind of announced their, you know, kind of their pause, right, CPI and the pause from the Fed meeting, et cetera, that where we had that big jump up in the market, that big kind of gap. So basically just kind of return back to that 50 day moving average would not be surprising at all. Now, again, that's not bearish at all. Uh, that would actually be a much better entry point to add to exposure and portfolios, you know, for this year. Um, but again, we're very early and again, you know, uh, wondering how big this correction could ultimately be is, is an unknown. Uh, at this moment, but you know, we are getting set up here potentially to work off some of this overbought condition and we're in that process. So we'll see how long this takes. But again, just be a little bit cautious here about, you know, rushing into the markets, let the markets kind of work themselves out here a bit. And I think you'll have a better entry point. Uh, one thing we talked about previously too, is that interest rates had gotten extremely overbought, just like stocks. So during the, the month of November, December, um, you know, stocks ran up sharply, bond yields fell, and again, bond yields got uh, very overbought, uh, very overbought as well on that pullback. So again, we're starting to see a little bit of a correction now in bond yields. And so again, they're triggering a buy. So remember, yields and bond prices are, are reversed. So we're starting to see a buy signal on interest rates, suggesting interest rates are about to go up some. And so again, that wouldn't be surprising here. Uh, interest rates got very, this big drop in yields, uh, obviously got very overdone here. So again, uh, I wouldn't be surprised uh, to see bond yields get back above 4%. That'll give you a much better opportunity to add bond exposure to your portfolio if you need to this year. Um, you know, and particularly at a little bit uh, better yield level as well. So again, we're, we're, you know, the, this kind of correctional process in the market and correctional process in bonds at the same time, that's kind of been that correlation that we've had here for a while. So seeing this correlation continue uh, would not be surprising. So again, just be a little bit patient here. Um, again, I don't know how big of a correction we're going to get. It's not going to be massive, but we could certainly see a, a bit of a process that takes two, three weeks to kind of work through work off some of these previous overbought conditions on both interest rates as well as, as stock prices and give you a better entry opportunity to put capital to work. So just kind of hold some cash right now, uh, be a little bit patient, but that's what you need to know before the bell this morning. Now, when we come back, we'll pick up with Danny Ratliff. Um, you know, we've got a couple of interesting topics to go into, uh, particularly as we start thinking about, you know, this year and, and kind of, you know, where markets may wind up and again you know we kind of reset the table at the beginning of every year but you know this is just going to be a another year where we're trying to figure out what's going to happen next right so we'll get into all that with Danny Ratliff this morning so don't go away more of the real investment show coming up right after the break get by the website make sure you're registered for upcoming event on January the 27th as well just click that banner at the top of the page get your tickets now uh, we'll love to see you there as well so be right back after the break don't go away Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. Coming up January the 27th, we're having a special event. It's called Navigating the Markets in a Presidential Cycle. Greg Vallier is coming to be the keynote presentation. Adam Taggart will be there. Michael Leibowitz, myself, will be spending the morning talking about the economy, the markets, presidential election cycles, what to expect. Tickets are on sale right now. Early bird registration on the website. If you go to Real Investment 
investmentadvice.com. Click on the banner at the top. Tickets are $99. We've got very limited seating at Hotel Sinesta here in Houston. Uh, you get your early bird special now. Ticket prices will go up as we get into early January. Get your tickets now on the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. Small businesses are now being challenged by the lack of employees and how to attract and recruit the best employees. To get the better employee, you'll have to offer a better package. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Don't assume a 401k plan is too costly or complicated for your small business to offer. Let us show you how to make the most of an affordable and effective plan that will deliver true value for your business and your employees. Call me toll free at 8 RIA plan or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. Have the market's gyrations made you nervous? If so, it's because you have more risk in your portfolio than you realize. It's time to reevaluate your long term investing strategy with RIA advisors. Our disciplined approach can help eliminate unnecessary risk. We do that by having both a buy and sell discipline. Does your advisor do that? If you think it's time to work with an advisor who puts your interests first, it's time for real investment advice. RIA Advisors, 855-RIA-PLAN, riaadvisors.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. A passive investment portfolio requires active risk management. It's not a choice, it's necessity. Diversification doesn't protect against risk of loss. Let us actively help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show this morning. Of course, it is Wednesday, and that means that Danny Raff, Ratliff is uh, finally here. He's been gone so long, I forgot what he looks like. You know, he's been traveling and playing with friends and all those type of things. What's up, Danny? Man, I wish. <laughs> Glad to have you back. Good to be back. Good. But starting the new year right? I suppose so. <laughs> here we are. Here we are. <laughs> So a couple of things I thought was interesting. Uh, you know, there was a story out this morning, uh, Rich Dead, Poor Dead, um, Robert Kiyosaki. And there, there's an old saying that, you know, if you own the bank, um, you know, $100,000 on a loan, it's your problem, right? But if you owe the bank a million dollars, it's their problem. Um, and this always becomes an issue. And this is why rich people use a lot of leverage. And I thought this the, in this article... Um, Danny, that uh, was on Yahoo Finance, I guess, um, was talking about Robert Kiyosaki, and he says basically he has $1.2 in debt, so if he goes bust, it's the bank's problem, not his. Yeah, and I, and I think that's right in, you know, in many ways, and I think the problem is, is that how many people use debt, and, and he even notes this as well. He says, look, most people use debt to purchase liabilities. Right. Whereas he's purchase he's using debt to purchase an income producing asset or some type of investment or business whatever it may be that's going to hopefully benefit him in the future it's like he says hey i've got nice cars i've got a rolls royce a ferrari because those are liabilities those mm -hmm. are those are you know those are a little bit different than what he's using debt for in general right so the income he gets from that he can go buy you know more expensive things now granted this is somebody who's also used the tax code to his advantage in the past he's filed for bankruptcy you know, clearly not opposed <laughs> to what most people are comfortable doing. Right. But it is a different mindset. And I, I do think that, you know, when a lot of people read this article, they're like, oh, well, debt, that's not a bad thing. Well, it depends it's, on what it's for. Well, exactly. And this is always the case. You know, you know, poor people use debt to live. Rich people use debt to grow money. Right. Correct. And, and, it's, a, and it's a very different thing. You know, if you're, you know, credit card debt is a terrible thing. And again, you know, it, it, you know Dave Ramsey is very popular for a reason. Um, because most people um, are in debt with bad debt, right? They have credit, and I don't mean bad debt like they're not paying their debt, but they have debt that works against them. They're having increased interest payments that are taking away from their disposable income, so they can't save or invest into other things. So they've got credit card debt, they've got student loan debt, they've got these other type of things. But you know, this was one of the big arguments over Elon Musk. Everybody was all upset about the fact that Elon Musk wasn't paying taxes. And we hear this a lot, you know, about corporate executives. Well, you know, Jeff Bezos doesn't pay any taxes and, um, you know, Mark Zuckerberg doesn't pay any taxes. Well, there's, a, you know, 
most of their wealth, yes, these are very, very wealthy guys, but most of their wealth is in corporate stock, right? And they can't sell their stock because if if all of a sudden, you know, Jeff Bezos sells, um, you know, 10 million shares of Amazon, the, the market goes, what does he know that we don't know? And so everybody sells Amazon stock. Um, so it hurts the company. So they can't use that wealth that they have in terms of stock to go spend that money. So what they do is, is they go to the bank and the bank lends them money against their stock. So they have these loans that are out there that they go buy these big houses and mansions and yachts and everything else. But, you know, that's that's, you know, they're using debt to that advantage, you know, through their corporate stock ownership. So so again, you know, debt's not a bad thing as long as it's used properly. And I think one of the key differentials here when you start talking about using debt is what's behind that debt. And if you and if you look at, you know, houses are a great example. I can buy a million dollar house. I, I put 20% down, right? So I have two hundred thousand dollars down, but I have a million dollar asset. So, you know, that's using that leverage. And of course that if that asset can produce an income stream, that's that's where I start, you know, using the income stream to pay off the debt. Then eventually the debt's paid off. And I now had a $200,000 investment that's worth a million dollars in this asset. So that's using that debt to that advantage. And that's why real estate has always been a very good way to build wealth over time because of that ability to leverage. Yeah, but I think the problem a lot of times with people do with real estate in, in general is that nobody's willing to make a sacrifice. They always want something that is probably beyond their means. Right. And so, and, and look, the, the mortgage industry, the real estate industry in general tells you, hey, oh no, you want you want to spend X amount? You can only afford 300,000, but look, you know, we can get you approved up to 450. Yeah. And then people think, oh man, this house is much nicer. Oh, real estate agents are the worst. Well, but so it, in, <laughs> They're the worst. And I'll t- no, I'll tell you why. Because, you know, you, you, you know, and this happens all the time. It's like I'll get with a real estate agent and say, okay, my wife and I are looking for a house, a $300,000 house. The first house they show my wife is like, you know, they, they walk in. It's like those TV shows. Thousand. Right. It's like those, those TV shows. They walk in. This house is beautiful. It's got everything she wants in it. Right. And, you know, what do you think this house is worth? <laughs> it's like we set our budget with, oh, it's only 500 and we can get you approved for that. So, you know, you know and, and so once you see that house, you never want to go back to the $300,000 house, right? Well, that's right. But also once you move into a house like that, you typically don't go get something cheaper. Right. And that's a problem. And there's you a lot of people backwards. stuck in, in a difficult spot right now because they may own a home where their kids, now they're empty nesters, but, you know, mortgage rates are still, you know, although they've come down quite a bit, they're still high in relative to where they've been over the last, you know, 10 years. So people are very, um, you know, cautious to move, but not, not only that, they may have to turn around and spend just as much on a smaller home that's newer yeah. than the house they've been in for the last 10, 20 years. Yeah. You know, that's kind of interesting. I was looking at some, uh, home sales data this morning and the supply of new homes has been surging here in recent months. And that's even despite the fact that interest rates have come down over the last two months, the supply of new homes is going up and the number of homes that are that are failing to close is also on the rise sharply interesting so you know you know we've been talking about for a while it's like you know this high interest rate you know when was going to impact the housing market we may start we may be starting to see kind of that early cusp and, and new home supply is always a really interesting indicator to look at because you know, there's all this, you know, there's been a lot of statements over the last couple of years like, well, there's just not enough supply of new homes. No, there's always plenty of supply of homes. There's never a lack of supply because at some point there's going to be more people wanting to sell than people wanting to buy. And that's when your supply of homes goes up. And that's what's happening right now. We're starting to see that. And even as interest rates are coming down, this is one of a one of the things that Mike and I had talked about previously on the show is that the curious thing is going to be when interest rates come down, there's a lot of people that are older now, their kids have left, right? Mm-hmm. And they have these houses. And, to your, and you're exactly right, Danny, to your point, is they're, you know, they're like, well, I, I can't sell my house now because if I sell my house, I'm going to go get a 7% mortgage on a smaller house and pay more money. It just doesn't make sense. But the question has always been, and maybe we're starting to see this, is that in mortgage rates come down, And all of a sudden they go, here's my opportunity. I can get out of my house now at a good price and go buy something else with a little bit lower mortgage rate and and kind of get to where I want to be. And all of a sudden you have this supply, this rush of supply come to markets. Now, it's very early, mind you. This is very early in the process. But I'm just curious if we may be starting to see kind of some of that 
that movement. Yeah, we, we may. I read a study last month, so don't quote me exactly on these numbers, but they said that over the last 15 years on average, there's been over 2 million homes on the market. Right now, we're at about 700,000 and mm-hmm. change. And you've had population growth of, growth of 30 million people. Mm-hmm. Now, what happens thinking about demographically when all these older people start passing away too, mm-hmm. and we don't have the flood. I mean, so the flood of that 30 million people is that, I mean, what is that a producing person? Yeah. Right. I mean, I'm not trying to get into another debate here, but is that somebody who's going to be able to economically support themselves? And, you know, we look at our immigration policy, which is a whole nother issue, which I think that's probably where a lot of the growth comes from. Yeah. Just because we know right now that most people are not having as many children as what their parents did. Right. So, you know, think demographically, will there later down the road, 10, 15, 20 years, be a different problem in housing? Yeah, no, it could be. And again, you know, just... You know, the big question has been is why hasn't there been this big, you know, mortgage rates went over 7%, so why didn't the housing market crash, right? And that's been kind of the one of the conundrums over the last year is all this expectation of a deeper set, you know, the Fed hikes rates. Why didn't we have a deep recession? Where was the housing crash? All these predictions from 2022 didn't come to fruition in 2023. So is it just a delayed cycle? And Again, could be. Uh, you know, there's been so much money just sloshing around the economy at, the, at this point. And again, then you've had the effect of uh, there was interesting. Uh, Congress is trying to now pass a bill to take Wall Street out of out of the housing market. It's been kind of proposed. Yeah. Uh, it'll do, this bill will do nothing because <clears throat> BlackRock doesn't own any houses. They own other companies that own all the houses. So yeah, you may get Wall Street out of the housing market, but they're not in the housing market. They just have investments in other companies that own, like Invitation Homes, owns 80,000 individual homes. So there's 80,000 homes owned by a company that are only for rent, right? That's 80,000 of whatever number of people that want to buy a home that can't buy a house because they're owned by an Invitation Home. So this bill in Washington will do nothing to fix that problem, but you know, it's it's that this has been one of those targets that you you and I have even talked about. This is that there's so many big you know pin, you know hedge funds etc. that are that are providing the capital to take homes off the market in terms of home ownership and turn them into rentals. And that's been a big move over the last few years because it's been very lucrative. Yeah, I mean, if you look at where rental prices have been, they've been elevated, albeit they are coming down a little bit. But since the pandemic, I mean, you've seen a significant change. Yeah. And then we still have some type of inflation, right? Everybody keeps talking about, oh, well, you know, inflation's come down. I don't see anything getting cheaper. Well, that's right, because we, we have disinflation, not deflation right now. Right. And then, you know, you look at the price of oil. You know, now you've got geopolitical <laughs> risk overseas with transportation. You know, you may see inflation be a little more stubborn here. I don't know. Yeah, could be. But uh, speaking of that, when we come back from the break, we'll talk about the January trifecta. Um, and what does that mean for the markets? Again, I touched on this a little bit uh, early, but I wanted to kind of get Danny's view on it as well. But, um, you know, what is the January trifecta? What does it mean? And uh, what does that suggest for the markets this coming year? We'll talk about that when we come back from the break. Don't go away. investment advice blog it's required reading for the informed investor catch it today at realinvestmentadvice.com coming up january the 27th we're having a special event it's called navigating the markets in a presidential cycle greg valier is coming to be the keynote presentation adam taggart will be there michael Leibowitz, myself will be spending the morning talking about the economy the markets presidential election cycles what to expect tickets are on sale right now early bird registration on the website If you go to realinvestmentadvice.com, click on the banner at the top. Tickets are $99. We've got very limited seating at Hotel Sinesta here in Houston. Uh, You get your early bird special now. Ticket prices will go up as we get into early January. Get your tickets now on the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. 
plumb miss that candy coffee. Whatever am I gonna do? Don't you worry, little darling. We'll watch it again on our YouTube channel. Why, Red? I never! The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all of our past presentations from Candid Coffee and Lunch and Learn, the special topic discussions, and all of our live show recordings preserved for you. Subscribe now to the Real Investment Show YouTube channel or look for the link on our website at realinvestmentadvice.com. Can't catch the whole show now? Listen to our podcast later at realinvestmentadvice.com. What is it about teenagers that they cannot keep up with their chargers? I don't get it. I've had the same charger for like a hundred years. I had chargers before they were even chargers, and it's the same one. The Real Investment Show podcast. Chargers and AirBuds, AirPods, whatever. I'm a Samsung guy. I'm, I'm with the other 75% of the population that has a real phone. Truth. I just speak the truth. Just say it. Just... At realinvestmentadvice.com. If you want to know the truth, listen to this show. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Manage risk and volatility rather than trying to manage gains. You don't have to be right all the time. Long-term investing success is a 70% gain. Let us help you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors. 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. Health and financial security touches everyone within your organization. Offering benefits for all doesn't need to be complicated. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, Senior Benefits Consultant at RIA Advisors. RIA Benefits provides independent expertise to find solutions that speak to the mission of your business, the culture you want to establish, and the budget you are able to work within. Book a free consultation with me at realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement, and we'll find a solution that takes care of your most important asset your people. Realinvestmentadvice.com slash retirement. Realinvestmentadvice.com. Hi, Lance Roberts here. If you're like most people, your 401k plan represents the bulk of your retirement assets. And unfortunately for many, managing your 401k plan can be difficult. There's so many choices, so many things to consider. With just a quick email, a couple of questions, you can put RIA advisors to work for you managing your 401k plan. It's a quick and easy application. Just simply click ask a question at realinvestmentadvice.com or give us a call at 855-RIA-PLAN. That's realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show YouTube channel has all our videos ready for your easy access. Now with the new and improved Before the Bell Report, subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel at realinvestmentadvice.com. You're listening to The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show this morning. Danny Ratliff joining me on this Wednesday. So the trifecta, right? This just sounds, this sounds cool, right? If we can just get this, these three things to happen and it's good to go for the year now, it's, this is always the subject of great debate, but there's, you know, there's a lot of, you know, wall street axioms uh, along the way, you know, the first five days of January, so goes the first five days, so goes the month, so goes the month, so goes the year. Um, so January trifecta, of course, you know, we also have the, the NFL, uh, predictor, you know, whoever wins the Super Bowl, right? That, you know, supposedly predicts how the markets do for the year. You know, a lot of this stuff is anecdotal, but, you know, it's always interesting to talk about, I guess. But the, the trifecta is, of course, the Santa Claus rally, which is the last five days of December and the first two days of January. Um, if that's positive, so now you have to go back and look, where did we start the market, you know, five days before the end of the year? Where are we now? So if today ends lower and we take out the Santa Claus rally, that will be a failure. So if we close lower today than where we started five days before the end of December, that's the Santa Claus rally because this is the second day of trading, the second trading day of January. Now, if we look at the first five days of January, right, we were lower yesterday. Looks like we'll be lower today if the market closes where it opens. So if the first five days of January are positive, that suggests that January will be positive. So if they're not positive, then supposedly January will be lower. If January is lower, then that's going to be the year. So the trifecta is a positive Santa Claus rally, last five days of January, first two days of, of, of Jan uh, sorry, last five days of December, first two days of January. The first five days of January need to be positive, and the month needs to be positive. Now, if you get that January, if you get that trifecta in place, 
historically speaking, the odds are that you're going to have a positive year. Now, what is that? You know, it's always now this is always the interesting thing, right? What do they mean by a positive year? That just means the market can be up 0.1% and that's a, that you win, right? <laughs> it doesn't mean you're going to have another 20% gain year, but uh, again, you know, historically speaking, markets average about 10% um, you know, during a presidential election year. And when you have a year where you had a preceding year of 24, over 20%, we were up 24.2% last year on the S&P, um, the average gain the year following is about 9 to 10%. So, you know, there's, there's a lot of indications that suggest that this year will continue to be positive if we can get this January trifecta in place. And again, a little bit of a rough start to the year so far. Danny, what do you think? Well, I mean, just like there, you have to take many of this with a grain of salt. <laughs> yeah, of course. You know, you look at some of the other flashing you know, signs out there, yield curve being inverted, the leading economic index still negative for how many consecutive months now? We're yeah, on like 19, 20. 20. Yeah. yeah, I mean, so these are things that we they're all subjective. And there's a lot of different things that are at play right now. But if you do go back and look, when you do have all three of these things add up, about 90% of the time you see a positive year. Mm -hmm. And so, albeit there's been a lot of skepticism going into, you know, it's, it's so funny how quickly we forget where we were and what's gone on. Now, number one, these, these index returns are very misleading in many ways because of, like we've talked about over and over again, that Magnificent 7 has become such a large part of the indexes that it really skewed things. Now, I think we've been more encouraged over the last, you know, month and a half, two months of the year that more of the market participated, right? We saw a broader movement. It wasn't just those handful of companies that were doing very well. And you begin to see, we're beginning to see, looks like maybe a rotation. Right. So that's encouraging in some ways. Are there still hurdles that this market must overcome? Absolutely. I mean, you know, we can talk about those for days. I think the, the list of cons for until October was way bigger than the list of pros. And now it seems like everybody's jumped from one side of the boat to the other. Yeah. And so we have to be cautious with all any of this information that's out there. Um, you know, and I think this is why it's important. You know, you hear so many people wanting to jump all the way in or all the way out of markets. And that's why it's so difficult when you right. do so. Well, no, and this is, you know, and it's so very interesting because if we go back to September, October, you know, we were buying stocks in September and, you know, kind of early in October, we were adding some positions to the portfolio and doing those type of things. And we were getting a lot of grief from people. It's like, this market's just going down. Why are you buying stuff? You know, and, and it was like, just, hey, be patient here because we're going to be set up. We're getting set up here for a fairly strong rally. It's super negative sentiment. Everybody was bearish. And now it's very interesting. You know, two months later, it's everybody. It's, you can't find a bear, right? Yeah, <laughs> so, everybody would like to jump in now. Yeah. And, and, you know, now we're overbought. We'll likely see a little bit of a maybe a little bit of relief here in some ways and, and relief, not in a good way that most people want. Right. Just me and the market will, you know, you're either going to trade sideways or maybe, maybe pull down a bit just because you're overbought. And at the end of the day, you're going to see people probably on the other end of that. Yeah. And the end, but this is, this is always, you know, the hard part. And, and you know, one thing that, you know, it's, it's, and we've talked about this on the show before, and I think it's just such an important point. The biggest mistake that investors make is looking at their portfolio from January the 1st, through December 31st. Mm -hmm. And how did I do last year? That tells you nothing about what your investment strategy is or what how you're allocated or you know what you know anything else is going on. Um, you know, this is why you need to look at your portfolio over longer periods. You know, how have I done over the last three years? How have I done over the last five years? And having that tied not to an index, your goal, your job is not to beat an arbitrary index. Your job is to make a certain amount of money to reach your financial goals with the least amount of risk. That's that's the goal. So if you need yeah. a 5% rate of return, you build a portfolio to generate a 5% rate of return or 6 or whatever it is. And that's your hurdle rate. And Danny and Richard do a great job of establishing hurdle rates for clients. But that's that's your goal. And you look at that over a three- or four-year period – rather than January 1st, December 31st. That's the worst mistake you can make because it caused, doing that causes you to jump from the frying pan into the fire uh, because you wind up chasing last year's hot performance. So again, everybody's looking at their portfolio right now going, wow, last year, Apple, Amazon, N NVIDIA, those did great, so I'm going to go buy those stocks now. And we may be seeing the early rotations from those stocks into the most hated companies last year. Healthcare did really well yesterday, 
Um, energy. You know, energy did well yesterday as well. And those were the, the, the worst, some of the worst performing sectors last year. So again, markets rotate, and this is why it's always never a good idea to look at really short-term time frames uh, in your portfolio to make investment decisions. You know, buy fundamental value, buy dividend growth. That's, that's going to work for you long-term. It's not going to beat the market every year, but it's going to generate growth for you over time. Yeah, but I think that's a problem. You know, that's, that's a really good point you just made that a lot of times we do look backwards, looking forward to our, what we potentially right. see for returns. And so right now, a lot of people re, re you know, positioning their 401ks, getting into the new year. And, you know, I see a problem a lot of times that we look back and say, oh, wow, that one, they just look at the returns, not understanding the investment, how it works, what it means, what's going on. Should we be in that, that was the hottest last year? History typically tells us no. I mean, if we would have, nobody wanted to touch tech this time last year, right? Right, and it was it was really the the one big bright spot of the market as a mm-hmm. as a whole. Yeah. And so, if you would have gone all the way out of tech, you would your your returns would have struggled. Right. If you'd have been all the way in, you know, you're you're just coming back. You're trying to dig yourself out of a hole. Right. And so that could be the problem that we see here moving forward. Yeah, no, and this is why it's always, you know, it's very important. Morningstar is the worst thing to look at in terms of picking an investment because they say, well, you know, the one, three, five year track record of, or the three, five, 10 track record of this particular fund is X. Well, it doesn't tell you what happened in between, yeah. <laughs> right? It's always about when you start the investment. So if you look at a mutual fund that has a three year, five year, 10 year track record of, of stellar performance, it may have just been luck of the draw of where that fund started and what was going on in the markets. And going forward, that performance is most likely not going to repeat. Um, so it's always important to understand, well, what happened if I would have bought this fund, you know, in between the one year and the three year record? What if I bought it in year two? And then look at these individual one year returns and you'll see a very different outcome in a lot of places. So, again, it's always important that you remember that past performance is not predictive of future results, right? Because markets change, environments change, investment styles change. Some of your values in favor, some of your growth is in favor, and those things are going to rotate. So this is what makes it difficult for investors. You know, growth did well last year, so I'm going to go buy growth, and this is a year where value does better, right? And so then you jump from value, uh, you know, jump into value right at the time that growth begins to outperform again. You know, and this is this is why investors generally wind up. You know, the best thing to do is, is pick a strategy, and stay with that strategy as long as it's a good, sound one. Right? <laughs> you got to have a sound investment strategy, but you stay with it in good markets and bad. And over time, it you know, if you particularly if it's a value based, fundamental driven investment strategy, you're going to win over time. You're not going to win every year, and investing isn't a competition. This isn't some, you know, you don't get a medal at the end of the year because you beat the market, right? Nobody shows up at your door and says, oh, here's your medal for me. <laughs> it doesn't happen. Um, you know, and nobody shows up when you get, you know, beat to death by the market either. Um, it's not a competition. The goal is just to survive the game long enough to make sure you win. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think that's the problem that many people judge their investments by is just particularly purely performance based on, you know, year to year. And, and so, you know, a lot of times we make that jump because of that. And then, you know, not understanding what does somebody do, you know, bigger picture, what is the long-term goal? What are the objectives for these funds? How do you mitigate risk? Is there potential for that? And that even goes back to passive versus active management. You know, you think about that, passive investing has become such a big trend, but nobody's truly passive because they're jumping from one thing to the next. No, no. And look, and the media is, is culpable, right? Oh, yeah. the media is what has driven this because the media wants you to compare. Because if you compare your results, you move money, and money in motion creates fees and money for Wall Street. Not for you, but it creates money for Wall Street. So that's why they trained you to think this way. Change your thinking, you'll do better. All right, quick break. We'll come back. Uh, Social Security benefits are increasing for 2024. This is why I'm retiring next year. Don't go away. Get daily investment news you can use. Delivered at the speed of the internet at realinvestmentadvice.com. 
coming up January the 27th, we're having a special event. It's called Navigating the Markets in a Presidential Cycle. Greg Vallier is coming to be the keynote presentation. Adam Taggart will be there. Michael Leibowitz, myself, will be spending the morning talking about the economy, the markets, presidential election cycles, what to expect. Tickets are on sale right now. Early bird registration on the website. If you go to realinvestmentadvice.com, click on the banner at the top. Tickets are $99. We've got very limited seating at Hotel Sinesta here in Houston. Uh, you get your early bird special now. Ticket prices will go up as we get into early January. Get your tickets now on the website, realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show YouTube page has all of our videos ready for your easy access. From three minutes on markets and money to each day's radio shows like Technically Speaking Tuesday, Financial Fitness Friday, and the latest analysis from Lance Roberts and Michael Leibowitz. Subscribe and bookmark our YouTube channel for The Real Investment Show. Or just click on the show links at realinvestmentadvice.com. Small businesses are discovering that attracting and retaining top talent come down to more than just salary. In today's highly competitive job market, compensation is more than just wages. Hi, I'm Tom Allen, RIA Advisors Retirement Plan Consultant. Healthcare and retirement plans can make the difference in hiring and retaining the best employees. We can show you how to build an affordable, effective employment package that delivers true value for your workers and your business. Call me toll free at 855-RIA-PLAN or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. And now, another page from the Real Investment Advisors Investing Manifesto. Bulls win in bull markets. Bears win in bear markets. Eagles soar above and take advantage of opportunity. Let us help you soar as you reach your financial goals with RIA Advisors. Neither bull nor bear. RIA Advisors, 281-501-1791 or online at realinvestmentadvice.com. The Real Investment Show. And welcome back to the show this morning. All right, uh, coming up in 20... I'm not actually retiring. Danny won't let me. Uh, but Social Security is starting to creep up there to where it's the, the, the trade-off is starting to get appetizing. No. Okay, but thanks for clarifying that because I'm, you saved me from a bunch of emails and phone calls later. <laughs> what, Lance? No. Yeah. But, but Social Security is... You are getting a cost of living adjustment. So you've heard the acronym COLA, and so that stands for that. And... Last year, it was much higher. It's 8.7%. This year, it is 3.2%, which is actually higher than any other year that we've seen uh, all the way going back to 2011. You know, obviously, inflation has been relatively low. We have sparked it considerably, and um, everybody's getting a little bit of a raise. So not, yep. not a bad deal. 67 million Americans on Social Security. So hopefully, you're, uh, you saw your paycheck go up a little bit. $55 a month is what the average is. There you go. Not bad. So, I'll take it. So now, but again, it, I know everybody's saying, what am I going to do with 55 bucks to fill up a tank of gas? <laughs> I mean, yes, yes. It's not, Hey, you know what? It's better than a sharp stick in the eye. Yeah. Something's so, better than nothing. Yeah. You know, and then if you're worried about the national debt, then this is, you know, big people's concern, right? There's a big chunk of our national debt, uh, which is all tied up in social security and Medicare and Medicaid. So yeah, well, you're, and, and you, many, many things. Yeah, yeah. exactly. And, and, and you know, you and I've had this debate often: is that you know, Social Security is it going away? What are they going to do? Clearly, reform needs to be done. Don't make an emotional decision, though. Social Security will be around. I mean, you look at the, just the amount of people, or some form of it. Look at how many people rely on it for a considerable amount of their income. I mean, it's through the roof. Well, and unfortunately, you know, uh, you know, this is and this has always been the case. And I've I've been writing about this for the last several years uh, and the the problems with Social Security. And you look at, you know, the underfunded status of a lot of the programs inside of Social Security, et cetera. And they're clearly on a trajectory that they're going to run out of money in the next you know decade ish. Um, and, and always in these articles with the same statement, which is you have a choice, right? We have a choice. We could make some easy reforms right now that, you know, require minimal pain, but fix the problem long term. Or you can just not do anything and eventually everything blows up and you've got to fix it very painfully all at once. And, you know, unfortunately, because of the way our Congress runs and the way our politicians work, nobody wants to touch Social Security because it's basically an election killer. 
Well, right? they, they've talked about this. They they've talk about they've it, tried they to address this. We've had bills put out there each and every year. But you're right. It is very non-electable. And so, um, you know, but if you look at the numbers, more than mm-hmm. half the people that are retired right now rely on Social Security for more than half of their retirement income. Yeah. 25 percent rely on it for more than 90 percent of their retirement income. I mean, these numbers, we have we have a huge problem, a savings problem yeah. here. And, you know, we can we can blame it on a number of different things, but we do know this does need to be fixed. We do need to address this. Um, you know, seems like a lot of people have the same problem the government did, and they probably spent too much. Well, it is. But, and, and again, to your, you know, it's always interesting is that, you know, and in fact, you just heard this uh, last year. You know, we're starting to get ready for the presidential election cycle this year. Um, you know, I heard it during the midterm elections. It's like, oh, the GOP, the, the Republicans want to take your Social Security away. No, there were some proposals to try to start tweaking some of these, you know, addressing some of these problems. But immediately if you try to, and again, this is the point, you know, the reason nothing will get fixed is because as soon as you try to make even a small adjustment to it, it's immediately becomes a political football for, oh, correct. for the opposing party to try to not get you elected. So this is why nobody wants to touch it. And again, at some point, the debt, the deficit, or just simply the availability of funds uh, with which to supply Social Security checks are going to become a problem and you're going to have to make massive changes very painfully all at once uh, to fix the problem. And that's, you know, and that's the, and the unfortunate thing about this is that, you know, we could make very small changes, raise the retirement age, you know, raise the full retirement age, you know, make some adjustments to the Social Security cap, which is what, 400000 right now in income? No, no, it's like 160 something. 160 yeah, I don't know yeah. what the, I need to go back and look at the updated number for 2024, but yeah. It's, yeah, I mean, you're capped. So if you're making $400,000 and it's 160, you only pay Social Security tax on the first 160,000 of income. So, you know, we could do little things that, that solve, that make big, you know, make a big footprint over time. But again, just nobody wants to touch it. It's unfortunate, but this is where it is. Well, and, and that's right. And it's, this is a, it's, it's not a partisan issue. This is a bipartisan issue. And, and as you mentioned, this is, if you address it now, the pain is much, much less than if you wait until 2033 or, you know, Congressional Budget Office needs to come out with new studies saying, you know, exactly how long it could go. We will be inundated with um, emails, calls, and, um, you know, headlines yeah. on Social Security's going broke. I'm taking it now. Don't, because listen, if you're going to get a reduction in benefits, and, and you know, the last study showed that there would be a, about a 20% reduction in benefits, would you rather be off a smaller amount or a larger amount? Right. You know, I, I think you'd like it over off of a larger amount. But I just don't, you know, you look at the numbers, I don't believe it's going to be, it, it, that's going to no, be something some, that happens. Some, so some, many people rely on it. I know. No, something will get done. It will be in the 11th hour, right, <laughs> of some event. But, you know, we'll eventually come up with some way to fix it. Let me, I'm going to jump to another topic real quick on retirement because um, this has been one of my pet peeves for a long time, which is Monte Carlo simulations. Mm-hmm. Um you know, when you, it's always interesting when, you know, people run, you know, financial plans. I see these all the time. I know Danny does too. But you and see, we run Monte Carlo. Right, right. And, and yeah, we use Monte Carlo. But, you know, you, what you've got to understand about Monte Carlo simulations is that that's not the way the market actually works. Well, <laughs> and, you know, it, it gives you a range of potential outcomes, right? It's just, but, you know, you have to also factor in. You know, it's using average historical rates. And again, this is what we're talking about earlier. Is like, yes, the market returns on average this over time. And the important thing to understand about Monte Carlo simulations is that the future is not necessarily going to be the past. Well, I think so that's that's got a, a very valid point. But I think that's the problem that what most people do. It's the data that you put in. So if you say we're going to look at historical and just say the market's done eight percent every mm-hmm. year for the last you know fifty years, well, but did it do eight percent every single year? And that's what a lot of these programs will put in is that every year they make 8%. Mm -hmm. Or you see the guys that say, well, if you only save $2,000 each and every year, put it into a Roth, by the time you're X amount, you're going to have this many millions of dollars in the bank. And they use that 8% once again, or 10, 11, 12. I mean, we see it all. And that is what they make the assumption that you make. But that's exactly right. That's not how money works. You know, last year, tech was down, what? 32, 33, well, the year before last, excuse yeah, me, 22. 22. Last year, tech was up 42. So are you back to even? Yeah, no. No. 
Um, so that's part of the problem that you see with some of these simulations is that they don't actually understand how money works. Yeah. Um, and so when we do Monte Carlo, we use very low rates of return. We create a hurdle rate because we're going to assume for this. We're going to also throw in bad numbers. What happens when you have bad years? What happens when the next two years that you go to retire are negative? How does that impact you and your family? And, you know, look, when we use these simulations, I mean, I do think we'll likely end up better off than what we suggest. But our job is to play devil's advocate. Our job is to stress these funds to make sure that, you know, we don't get to that point where you say, well, you know what? I'm sorry. Lance's plan doesn't work. I mean, yeah. Lance's plan never works. <laughs> he can't retire. <laughs> but um, I'm broke. <laughs> but you, you get my point. You yeah, know, but and, no, but and that's no, that's and the important part. But about and this is the thing is like, and if you've ever seen a Monte Carlo simulation, this is this is my personal problem with Monte Carlos. And again, it's, it's so so. Maybe back up and give you know a little bit more color on exactly yeah. what that is. Right, that's what I'm gonna say. Yeah, that's what I'm gonna explain. Is that you'll see a, a chart and it'll have like a thousand lines on it, and they're all in very light shades of gray, and they're in the background. But you see all these lines. You got you know, and and it's each year of returns. And so 1900, the market did this. 1901, the market did this. 1902, and then there's this dark line in the middle that's the average of all these return years, and then that's what your plan is based on. And and again, that's fine as, as you're just talking about. But what happens if you're close to retirement and that's the year where the market's down 20 or 30 percent? Yeah, that's right. that's a game changer. So those first two years, studies show, are so important. Really, the first two and first 10. Right. If you can survive that and, and number one, you don't spend too much or, you know, take major drawdowns and, you know, major drawdown is going to be 20, 30, 40 percent. Mm-hmm. You, you can come back from a 10 percent drawdown. But. What happens when it's much, much larger? That is where I think that people, you know, if, if you have a much larger drawdown, life will change. Yep. You got to start cutting back. You're going to have to cut expenses. You got to forego trips, travel. Some may go back to work. And if we want to avoid that, you know, that's why I think, you know, we, we talk about active and passive management. Mm-hmm. That's where you have to be extremely cautious and understand exactly how money works. Because, you know, we talk to people a lot of times and, you know, they'll say, well, here's how the market did. Well, okay, that's how the market did. But let's start talking about what that average looks like over longer periods of time and shorter, mm-hmm. if we want to compare it to that. Yeah. And again, you know, if you're if you're close to retirement and you're doing one of these, you know, kind of based kind of off the shelf financial plans, ask ask the advisor. So, what happens if I'm two years from retirement and the market's down twenty percent? What does my retirement outlook look like then? Right. Or just in, in you know somewhere in there, and again, you know, Danny brought up a great point. Let's say you were, you were two years from retirement two years ago, and you were depending on six percent rates of return over the last two years to meet your retirement goal. Well, the problem is, is that yeah, the market was up twenty four percent last year. It's still not back to all time highs. So you've had two years where your return rate has been zero because the market is basically where it was two years ago. So there's there's 12% sitting out there that you were depending on for retirement that you didn't get. Right? So now you're short your goal. And that's the and that's where, you know, this becomes a lot more important. And again, when you're sitting down with Danny or with Richard or your financial advisor, you know, ask those questions about what happens to my retirement ability if the market's down just before I retire. Yeah, it can be a game changer. So you need to understand and know those numbers, understand what is going into that financial plan a lot of a lot of planners will just take it off the shelf say just type in these historical returns understand what let's let's stress these funds to ensure that you guys can meet your goals and you know what that's what it's all about yep exactly stress test yep (laughs) well it's about meeting the goals and objectives right Right. we get those numbers locked in our head and we see this like whoa well we didn't do that or we did better than that that's great that's not always the goal. Exactly. All right, Danny, thanks so much. Thank you. All right, that wraps up the show for the day. Be back tomorrow with Michael Leibowitz uh, kicking off the new year. What's the Fed going to do next, right? That's going to be the big question coming up, you know, with the Fed meeting just around the corner. Employment on Friday. Lots of stuff we're about to get uh, thrown our way in terms of data. So we'll talk about that tomorrow with Michael Leibowitz. Have a great day. Be sure you buy the website. Make sure you sign up for our upcoming event, January the 27th. Um, it's going to be our economic summit for the year. It's going to be a great turnout. Uh, I forgot to raise the ticket prices. Go to the website now. Get them.